thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul has been writing to the church at Corinth, admonishing the church at Corinth mostly. He'll praise the church today, but he has been admonishing the church um, toward unity through maturity in the faith. And maturity in the faith not only involves knowledge, because knowledge puffs up, but maturity in the faith also involves edifying others, as we have seen. Paul is very intentional about his ordering of things, so it is no accident that he tackled Christian liberty before he gets to something that the church is very legalistic about, women covering their heads during times of prayer and prophecy. So he has talked about Christian liberty before getting to this moment in the text. We have learned from Paul and through Paul from Christ, we have learned that Christ owns everything. All the earth is his. And therefore, the produce of the earth is good. We cannot be content, condemned because of what goes into the mouth. Instead, what defiles a person is what comes, comes out of the mouth, either by false teaching or by the demeaning of other people. All sorts of wretchedness that the human tongue is capable of, which doesn't mean according to Scripture exactly what it means according to the world. In context, it means demeaning others, particularly those outside the church walls, condemning others according to our consciences rather than judging people righteously according to the Word of God, right? Whether we eat or drink, Paul's words, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God, and this is the meaning of Christian liberty. Now, after closing up his section on Christian liberty, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now we begin a new section where Paul is answering a different question, but still related to what came previously and what came before that, all the way to chapter 1, verse 1. Culturally, in Jewish society, it was considered modest and appropriate for women to wear head coverings, maybe at all times, maybe in the synagogue. She was to be seen by her husband. So this was a matter of modesty for first century women and men who wanted young women, virgins, to cover their heads, right? And a Apparently, and we don't know this for sure, but maybe this is contained within the letter that Chloe's people sent to Paul. Maybe there were some bucking tradition, bucking the cultural norm, the cultural paradigm. Maybe there were some young women in the church at Corinth who were being immodest according to the cultural definition of modesty. And so this question arises, and Paul has to deal with this controversy Should women wear head coverings? Because now it has become a controversy. We deal with some similar controversies today, as we're going to see in the text. In 2,000 years since Paul wrote this, uh, controversies in the church have not really changed that much. They're all pretty much about the same thing. Uh, In this case, it's women refusing to wear head coverings. Perhaps men wanting to wear head coverings. I don't know what that's about, but there's a hint of that in the text too. Um, But there's, in the church today, a desire women have to be like men and a desire men have to be like women, to blur gender lines, to blur the lines of sexual identity. There is a desire like this in the world and in the church today, and some people doing this. So so this controversy is not is not at all irrelevant. Uh, This means something for our day, and there is real application to be made here, and we're going to get into some of that. I'm going to read through the text first, and then we will walk through verse by verse like we normally do. Ken was saying earlier, uh, we prayed before the service started, and and, uh, Ken said, it's a good thing you're preaching this before our launch day. (laughs) 
We're going to see if you really pastoral material here. We're going to see if Ken has to stand up and tell me to stop preaching, right? That's what we're going to do. Uh, no, we're just going to walk through this verse by verse like we normally do. And uh, we're going to see, we're going to see basically the, the posture that men and women take in the church gathering. And I want to be very careful as we read through this not to read too much into this text as some do. I also want to be very careful not to read too little into this text like some do. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has something on her head or has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. And judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. The meaning there is plain, isn't it? I mean, it's so evident that we don't even need a sermon, right? We, we need no explanation here. Just, okay, uh, women are going to start wearing head coverings. Men are not. They're going to go bald. It's fine. And we're going to be good, right? Uh, there is a lot going on here in this passage. A lot going on in, in this particular teaching unit. And it is, it is difficult to follow this. Uh, there are quite a few people today uh, within the Reformed community who say, this is why women need to wear head coverings in church, right? Uh, this, is, this is why, there are people who say, this is why men, when it's time to pray, you remove your hat, you take your hat off, because you're not to wear a head covering while you're praying or prophesying. But there are women who take this even, even further, right, to say it's not only in church that we need to wear head coverings, it's Actually, all the time, and I, and I feel so convicted. You can see this in Facebook forums, right? Uh, I feel so convicted to wear a head covering that I'm going to wear a head covering all the time because of, because of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There are people who say that women, in order to be saved, you have to be married to a man because a man is the image and the glory of God. And without being subject to a man, you can't experience salvation. They'll relate this to 1 Timothy, where Paul writes to Timothy and said, women are saved through childbearing, and they'll go crazy with this. So people, they get all over the place with texts like this. And then you have the super-reformed who take this text to, to mean something about the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father, or eternal functional subordination of the Son to the Father. So please pray for me as I work through this. I hope to bring some clarity, and I hope not to cause more confusion 
about what Paul is getting at here in 1 Corinthians, uh, because this text really is really is a doozy, especially in 21st century American culture, where this text is often skipped over or not preached because of our current controversies. But we need to hear the Word of God, and we here at Douglas Reformed Church do not desire to skip anything because it is difficult to grasp or simply because it is difficult to accept. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul begins this section on head coverings. Now I praise you. This is the church at Corinth he's writing to. And we have been through 10 chapters in 1 Corinthians. And when has Paul praised the Corinthians up to this point? He hasn't. The first 10 chapters have been admonishing, correcting, rebuking the church at Corinth. And now Paul is turning around and saying, I praise you, which can be a confusing statement because Paul hasn't been praising the believers at the church at Corinth. He has not been praising this community of faith whatsoever. Why is Paul praising the believers in the church at Corinth here? Because, oh, look, he answers this in the text. Maybe we should look at the text to find out. Because you remember me in everything. Now, I don't know. Chloe's people sent Paul this letter. There are people in the church at Corinth who are hating on Paul. So they're thinking of him, right? Uh, so I don't know if, if this is like a sarcastic kind of jab at those who are hating on and, and being judgmental toward Paul, judging him like he's in some kind of law court setting according to what goes into his mouth like we've been talking about of the last few weeks. Uh, I, I don't know if he's going to take, I'm so glad you guys remember me, right? They're judging him, they're condemning him. I'm so glad you guys are thinking of me. This is so great. I praise you because you're thinking of me. Or if he's talking to Chloe's people, like, thank you for thinking of me. Uh, thank you for remembering me, writing your letter to me, uh, considering me important enough to ask my advice. Like, in any case, Paul is saying, I praise you because you remember me in everything. Whether they agree with Paul or not, they're still remembering him, right? I have people who think of me the same way and remember me the same way, not in a positive light, but in a negative light. So maybe I know what Paul is going through here a little, a little bit, and maybe, maybe you do too. Maybe there are people who remember you like this. And hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So there's something positive here. The believers at Corinth are holding firm to the traditions Paul delivered to them. When he planted the church, maybe in his previous letter to the church at Corinth, they are holding to what he taught them. But as we've seen, not practically. It's not flowing out in the application of doctrine. But the church is holding fast to the tradition Paul delivered to them. What kind of tradition did Paul deliver to the church at Corinth? Was this some kind of... Uh, Tradition in the Roman Catholic sense, the tradition of the fathers of the church. Well, no, the fathers of the church weren't around yet to give the tradition of the Roman Catholic church and to write that all down, right? Paul had to be talking about something else. Some other kind of tradition. Uh, what did Paul deliver to the church at Corinth? Well, he told us in chapter 2 when he said, I, I came to you knowing nothing but Christ and Christ crucified. So he told them about Christ and Christ crucified. And in chapter 4, verse 6, when he said, I'm figuratively applying these things to myself so that, you, so that you may learn not to exceed what is written. So the tradition that Paul delivered was Christ and Christ crucified, and it did not exceed what was written. It was sola scriptura. It was scripture alone. When Paul talks about tradition here, he's talking about the scriptures with reference to Christ. Nothing else. No tradition of humankind. Not church tradition. Not church dogma. He's talking about Christ and Christ crucified not exceeding what is written. Not exceeding the Old Testament. Just as I delivered them to you. You know these things. You know the doctrine I brought you. You know the Scriptures, believers at Corinth. I praise you for this and for remembering me, whether in a positive or negative light. I pray this is 
good. Knowledge is good. But what have we already learned about knowledge in 1 Corinthians? In chapter 8, knowledge puffs up. And knowledge by itself is not sufficient. Knowledge by itself cannot be the determiner of our faith or our maturity. Knowledge is good, but if that's all we have, we are going to be so prideful that we are not going to benefit anyone with the knowledge we have. After all, we are to be, we are to be focused on profiting others. Remember, there's a reason Paul wrote everything he did before getting to this point, before he got here. There's a reason what came first came first. He wanted us to know all of those things. So he praises the church at Corinth. You're very knowledgeable and you remember me. But this conjunction means that Paul's about to explain why he's, why he's not so fond of what the church is doing with this knowledge. It's good to have the knowledge, but... I want you to understand. Well, knowledge is it, it's different than understanding, right? We can have factual knowledge. We can memorize stuff and things. But it's possible to know a lot of stuff, technical terms here, it's possible to know a lot of stuff without understanding much. I've been there. I have hoarded knowledge and I have been a glutton on knowledge without much understanding. I'm sure we've all been there. Different types of knowledge even for the church at Corinth. It's biblical knowledge, theology. Religious knowledge, a knowledge of the law. But there was no understanding. Knowledge without understanding. Knowledge without love. And so nobody was being edified, as, as we have seen from chapter 8 onward. No one was being edified here. I'm going to tell you something this morning that might surprise you if you've been around church for a while. Okay? Memorizing Scripture is not as important as the church has made it. I think the church has committed some idolatry here, right? I mean, think about it. Who are the people we praise the most when they guest speak at a church? Those who have the whole Bible memorized. We put that in their bio when they're coming to guest speak at a church. This person has the whole Bible memorized. Right? Right? Those are the ones, the ones who have a lot of knowledge. Sunday school, as a kid, you remember the little sticker charts, if you've been in church, right? The little sticker charts. And did you bring your Bible? Check, sticker. You have last week's memory verse memorized. Check, sticker. And then that's where it ends, right? We're going to teach you what the Bible says, but... But then we're left wondering, how are our children actually understanding the scriptures rather than just memorizing a set of words, right? You can know two plus two equals four, right? No, without understanding how numbers work together. But if you understand how numbers work together, you can do any math problem. That's the difference we are talking about here. You can, you can know the content of the Bible but if you don't understand it, you won't know the God of the Bible. Paul here is saying, I want you to understand. Memorizing Scripture is good. Knowing theology is good. But it is not sufficient. We want to understand what God has for us. So concerning this question, head coverings, you can memorize a subset of laws and traditions and say, all right, that's what it says. And you can argue about that all day without having understanding. So Paul starts this not by accident saying, I want you to understand there's something deeper going on here than head coverings. And then after saying, I want you to understand, Paul talks about the Trinity and not the transcendent Trinity, not the 
relations of the members of the Godhead, but the economic trinity, the way the trinity operates in this world and relates to humankind. Look at this. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. Man actually here to mean males, right? Man here to mean males rather than just a generic term meaning humanity or persons, people. Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. And so we have some kind of economic structure presented to us. And we know this isn't a description of the, the transcendent trinity. So those, those who take, take this to be a statement about eternal subordination of the Son to the Father, or eternal functional subordination... They seem to be reading too much into this text because Paul here is describing economic trinity. Man and woman are not parts of the trinity, yet they are part of this paradigm. The way that the trinity is relating to the world. So this is economic and not transcendent. So we can't, we can't take God and describe his transcendent relations, those relations that, that, that are contained within the Godhead alone, because that's not Paul's illustration here. We can easily read too much into this and say, oh, yep, eternal subordination or eternal fun- functional subordination. We can't do that with this text. The man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. There's an economic structure handed to us here. And not a structure of identity, because it's not transcendent trinity, but of economy, of working out, of application, of appropriation in this world. And that structure is God, here to mean the Father, Christ, Jesus Christ, man, woman, in that order. And Paul is, is drawing out these distinctions, right? Now, concerning the wording here, in verse 3. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. How many men? Every. This expands beyond the church walls, right? Every man on earth is subject to Christ as his head. Every single man on earth. In the church, this would be manifest. We should be aware of this. We, we should subject ourselves to the headship of Christ. But, but every man bears a responsibility to Christ under the headship of Christ. Every single man on earth bears this responsibility. Whatever it means that Christ is the head of a, of a man, which Paul doesn't tell us. Paul doesn't tell us what it means that Christ is the head of a man here. It certainly means that the man is subject to Christ in some way, but we don't know how. The same way is true when we read about this, man is the head of a woman. We don't know how, we just know that in the economy of God, just as Christ is the head of a man, a a man is the head of a woman. And Christ hadn't told us how. So we can't read into this text and say, okay, well, well, women must must be married or something like that in order to be saved, right? We can't read that into this text. We can't read too much here. And God, the Father, is the head of Christ. However, this is working out, which Paul hasn't revealed yet. There is an economic structure. Here, verse 4. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying. Well, there's a clue. This economy is the economy of God as applied to praying and prophesying within the context of the gathering of believers. So so while we cannot say, right, that... um, that all people everywhere, all, all women should subject themselves to like all men, right? And we can't even say that. While, while we can't say that, we can say that all men everywhere has a responsibility to pray and to preach, to prophesy. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head, according to this text, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying, disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with the cultural expectations of the time, right? And the fact that women naturally just grow longer hair than men. Men naturally grow thinner hair and go bald sooner than women. If, do women even ever go bald naturally? I, I don't know, right? I'm sure that happens. But there's, there's some natural distinction here. 
For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman, which I'm sure is a rhetorical argument being used by Paul here. It should be evident to the believers at Corinth. She's not bald. Women in your culture don't shave their heads. That would be unacceptable. And so, so this praying with your head uncovered is also unacceptable, right? There should be distinctions here. Have her hair cut off or her head shaved or let her cover her head. And again, I think Paul is just getting at the, the natural distinctions. And notice here that there's, there's not a difference in what men and women can do in the church. We make that part of our argument too, right? Like, oh, look at this. Uh, therefore, women can't pray. Women can't sing in front of the congregation in church. Uh, women can't prophesy in this sense. And prophesy in this sense isn't some mystic sense of prophecy. Uh, Paul has already told us in 1 Corinthians, that we, as we've been walking through 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 4, verse 6, all, all over again, right? So that you might learn not to exceed what is written, which includes in our prophecy. So prophecy here, th- this is the, the exposition of Scripture alone, and not the traditions of men, because Paul has already said, don't exceed what is written. So whatever prophecy this is, it can't exceed what is written and if the, if the apostles weren't even exceeding what was written, they, they were expounding on the Old Testament scriptures, right? They were explaining those with reference to Jesus Christ. And then uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where the author of Hebrews identifies Jesus Christ as the fullness of the revelation of God the Father, right? In the flesh. So they're expounding on the Old Testament scriptures, explaining them in light of the revelation of Christ. That's what all of the New Testament authors are doing. And this is where I... Have people say, now wait a minute, what about the book of Revelation? Isn't that some sort of new vision, some sort of new prophecy where John is explaining the end of the world as yet to come from our perspective? Well, if, if we take 1 Corinthians seriously, this idea of New Testament prophecy seriously and the instruction even the apostles followed of not exceeding what is written seriously, then we have to say that the book of Revelation is an exposition of the Old Testament scriptures with reference to Christ. And then, then you, you look at Revelation, you start reading it, and it sure looks like the book of Daniel. You're thinking, okay, maybe, maybe John is expositing the book of Daniel, and some other prophets, right? There's some, there's some Isaiah in there, there's some Habakkuk in there, there's some Micah in there, right? Maybe he's expounding on the Old Testament prophecies. And if it's in reference to Christ, maybe he's explaining how Christ's kingdom has come. When he talks about tribulation and destruction and persecution, perhaps he's actually talking about something he is experiencing like he claims in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. So even the book of Revelation, it's an exposition, a creative exposition, an exposition in the apocalyptic genre, but an exposition of Old Testament prophecy with reference to Christ as John sees it in his own time. So if we read 1 Corinthians and we we exposit 1 Corinthians well, that means we, we cannot take a dispensational view of Revelation or premillennial view of the book of Revelation. We simply cannot without forcing a contradiction in the Scriptures because prophecy is not newly given. Even the apostles are expositing the Old Testament Scriptures with reference to Jesus Christ. Who here in this text in 1 Corinthians is expositing scripture and praying men and women within the context of the church gathering. Now this is interesting, right? Because your most conservative reformed guys in the public eye are saying no, women shouldn't be doing that that prophesying thing in the context of the church gathering. Even John MacArthur who is one of I would argue, the best expositors of our day, right? Even he looks at that and he says, okay, this is for men when they are praying and prophesying within the context of the local gathering. But then for women, it's when they're praying and prophesying elsewhere. But that's not a consistent hermeneutic. 
He says, for women, it's only when they're teaching the young ladies in the church. Or it's only when they're practicing evangelism outside the walls of the church. But there's no indication here that Paul is talking about a different type of prayer or prophesying. So here in a moment, when a young woman comes up here to sing a song to us, this text isn't speaking against that. That is okay. There's a form of prophecy, and it is good. This isn't a statement about the ability of men over women to pray and to preach in a public forum. This isn't a statement given to us in order to say men and women must do different stuff in the church, right? Well, no, because men and women are both here granted to pray and prophesy in the context of the gathering of the church. But there are different, different postures taken here. And this is what is different, the different, different postures. Men, pray and prophesy with your head uncovered in the first century. Women, pray and prophesy with your head covered. Why? Remember, Paul wants us to understand. He doesn't just want us to, to memorize stuff and things. He wants us to understand what's going on here. Verse 7, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Paul alludes to the very first two chapters in, in Scripture, in the Bible, to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In chapter 1, around verse 27, we learn God creates people, male and female, in his image. So Paul's not saying women aren't the image of God. He's just saying men, they're that, that direct representation of the glory of God on earth. And this is his explanation, right? In Genesis chapter 2, we get a closer look at the creation account, particularly the creation of woman. Like, God thinks so highly of women that they, they get their own chapter for creation. So, like, chapter 1, man gets a little sentence. And woman gets, like, a whole chapter devoted to her in, in the book because somehow she's, she's the focus. She's the object of redemption. She, she represents something here that is important. She gets a whole chapter. And God goes through this process with Adam. Well, Adam, na name all the animals. See if you can find, see if you can find an animal that, that could be a proper helpmate for you. And so Adam goes about naming all the animals. God, I can, uh, nothing here is sufficient. I can't find a helpmate. And these, this is lame, God. Come on, let's, can we do something else here? And after naming all the animals, God says, yeah, there's, there's not a proper helpmate for you. I want you to go through that process for a reason. He puts Adam to sleep. He takes a rib out and he forms woman. She's called woman because she was taken out of man. What Paul mentions here, right? So he creates woman. And he brings Adam, you know, back up from his sleep. And this fine thing next to me, God. What did you do here? Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is great. But God created a, a helpmate for Adam, and it was good. Remember, before it was not good, the man should be alone, but God created a woman. Now, it's good. This is good. And right there, Eve becomes the object of redemption. So Adam, being the image and glory of God, from him comes the woman. And in chapter 3, it is the, the fall of humankind, Right? And who is the promise given to Adam? Not a chance. The promise is given to Eve, the promise of redemption, that her seed would be redeemed. 
and that God would be the one doing the redeeming. And so right there in the first three chapters of Genesis, we get everything that Paul's talking about here. And this is beautiful, right? Man, image and glory of God, the Redeemer. From him, woman, the, the image of of the church, the object of redemption. Paul gets at this in Ephesians chapter 5, too. So this is Paul's theology, right? Now, this relationship between man and woman is a picture on earth in material form, the relationship between God and his church, his chosen people. The Redeemer, the object of redemption. That's why men in Ephesians are instructed to love their wives like Christ loves the church. Die for her. Sacrifice yourself for her. Redeem her. Free her. Liberate her. Don't oppress her. Right? And why women in Ephesians chapter 5 are instructed to respect, submit to their husbands as, as the redeemer of the household. It's not, not, some, not some weird instruction for women to be oppressed by men as some make it out to be. It's quite literally a picture of Christ in his church, the gospel in marriage. And that makes you think, well, here in 1 Corinthians, is Paul actually talking about marriage? Is he talking about women being under the headship of their husbands? Or, or is he talking about women being under the headship of every man? Well, this takes, this takes a closer look at the text to answer, Okay. Go back for a moment to verse 3, where it says, The man is the head of a woman. There's an interesting difference here. It's reflected in the Greek as well as the English. It's reflected the same way. The English is a good representation. Christ is the head of every man. So Christ, singular, head of every man, man, all men. But then the man is the head of a, a woman. So every man isn't the head of every woman, but each man is the head of a woman here. And then you look at the Greek and you look at the word there used for woman, and and it really is a word that refers to a married woman. Now that's interesting to me. That Paul would get at the marriage relationship here in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about the liturgy of the church and and place within church, which is why elsewhere Paul writes crazy stuff like women, if you're interested in causing an uproar in church, don't. Instead, remain humble, quiet, silent, go home and ask your husbands. Like, this is consistent with the rest of Scripture here. So all of a sudden we're seeing marriage Women ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, that's random. That's weird. Because of the angels? There's some sort of mystic sense in which angels are hovering around, and for some reason, for their sake, women need to submit to men. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? The Greek word for angels, angelos, means messenger. The best translation in English for the word angelos is messenger. Men are the image and glory of God. And women are under their headship, authority in some sense, prayer and preaching authority. Then this word messenger here simply refers back to the man for their sake for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the headship of Christ in the church. And this all goes back to Christ and the exaltation of Christ and the glory of God. We learn that this is authority. Well, what kind of authority? Surely the man just doesn't have plain authority over his wife to tell her what to do, especially in the church gathering. Right? This is authority when it comes to prayer and preaching. So women are given the opportunity to pray and to prophesy within the context of the local gathering. But not with authority over a man. Which is what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. 
Paul says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. To teach with authority over a man. To exercise authority over a man. But to remain quiet, there a word insinuating humility. It's not just an absolute quietness like women can't talk in church. That's ridiculous. It's referring to some kind of humility, right? And in fact, Paul even encourages men there in 1 Timothy. Practice humility. Be humble people. Live quiet lives and serve God with humility. Remain quiet, for it is Adam who was created, and then Eve, the same reasoning in 1 Timothy as we see in 1 Corinthians. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And then we get to this, this, weird, this weird revelation. But women will be preserved, sanctified through the bearing of children if they continue in the faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. That's weird. What does it mean that a woman is saved, preserved, sanctified through childbearing if her children continue on in the Lord or if she continues on in the Lord, right? What does that mean? What is Paul getting at there? And what does that have to do with the liturgy of the church we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Well, think about this. If the marriage relationship is a picture of the church. And the church is to embody what that marriage relationship looks like, which we're seeing here, right? The liturgy of the church embodies what a marriage relationship looks like. And Christ is exalted. Christ is glorified. Well, what is the church called to do? Paul has just finished talking about. Take the gospel. Contextualize the gospel identify with wretched people outside the walls of the local church. Partake in the gospel and advance the gospel and participate with Christ as he builds his kingdom on earth because he, he is reigning. Then you see Paul saying that women are being sanctified, preserved through childbearing. And in both cases, this is multiplication. And it's, it's almost as if, and when I say almost as if, I mean this is the way things are according to Scripture, okay? It's, it's almost as if God gave us childbearing and child rearing as a picture of what He was doing. Everything He created in us, everything He created us to do somehow paints a picture of who he is in his economy and his relationship to humankind, to the world. So through childbearing and childrearing, it's not like if a woman is barren, she's not getting into heaven, right? That's not what Paul is saying. Childbearing and childrearing, though, that is a picture of what God is doing in his manifest kingdom on this earth, multiplication. Why haven't we heard that before? Well, I have an answer. The modern day church has moved away from covenant theology. If we read with covenantal eyes and considering the covenants of God with people and how God has always been and the way he has dealt with people on earth, been revealing something about himself and his, and his covenants and the way he has created people. If we read the Bible with those eyes, a decent hermeneutic, we see that that has to do with covenant community and the building of Christ's kingdom. But if we get away from covenant theology into other stuff, we start getting into really dogmatic and legalistic and moralistic ways like Women aren't honoring God if they don't have any children. Those sorts of weird teachings. Like barren women won't be saved or preserved or sanctified. Well, we, we can't do that with the text. Why? Because this is so plainly the covenant 
of God manifests through the, 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 the natural carrying out what people were created to do, right? Even reflected in the very first command God gave Adam and Eve, which Paul is alluding back to. Multiply, fill the earth, rule over creation. Is that not a picture of the kingdom of Christ coming in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and the rest of the way down? Is it? Is that not a picture of the coming of the kingdom of heaven and now manifest in the church through this economic headship structure? And then Paul is sure to make this clarification starting in verse 11. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. They are codependent. Oh, so so you mean men are not more important than women, and women are not more important than men. Uh, You mean we actually need each other? Okay, I'm glad Paul made that clarification so that we are less likely to misinterpret this text, right? For as the woman originates from the man, in Genesis chapter 2, so also the man has his birth through the woman the rest of the time. Yeah? And all things originate from God. There we see again, all things originate from, from who? God. God is the one to receive all glory. And Paul says, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Be smart, y'all. Don't think that this is just about head coverings. This runs much deeper than that. This is about the glory of God, the exaltation of Christ. He says, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. She has a natural covering, a natural honor, a natural sign that there is There is headship over her. She gets the natural covering. She gets to be beautiful and men get to lose their hair. Right? And Paul perceives that there's going to be some contention about this. I don't know why there would be contention about this. Right? Why would there ever be contention in saying that in the economy of God, the Father wills, the Son wills, reveals it is the man's responsibility, primary responsibility to pray and to preach in the church and in his household and in the community, and it is the woman's primary responsibility to be the object of redemption. It doesn't bar her from praying and prophesying within the context of the local church, but when she does that, she needs to take a a posture of submission to the man's authority over prayer and preaching. Why would there ever be any problems with saying something like that? to taking complementarianism in creation and applying that to the operation of the local church. Why would there ever be any controversy there? We don't know anything about that kind of controversy today, do we? Uh, Yes, yes we do. There was the same sort of controversy in the first century. Like I said, 2,000 years have gone by and the controversy hasn't changed. Paul is addressing the same thing today that he did in the first century, and he, and he sees it coming. He sees the contentiousness, church people being contentious. What, you think church people are contentious today about stuff like this? Yeah. Paul says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we, meaning the apostles and Sosthenes in chapter 1, we remember we We saw that Sosthenes is co-authoring this with Paul. It's mainly Paul's words. I think Sosthenes' name was included to kind of bring more acceptance in the church at Corinth because he had a good reputation there, right? We, the apostles and Sosthenes, have no other practice. If not this, then what? Y'all are a little abnormal if you start thinking otherwise. This is accepted sound doctrine that women should should posture themselves like women and men should posture themselves like men. We have no other practice, 
nor have the churches of God. Everywhere we've been, you are the only one suffering from this controversy, church at Corinth. You're it. And that causes me to think about, like, gender distinctions today and sexual identity today. And this passage isn't primarily about wearing head coverings. It's easy to read the text, not understand it, glean that information, and have this, have this false, false conviction that women need to wear head coverings today, right? This is first century. It, it did apply to the culture then. But in today's culture, the heart of the matter is no different. We want to understand what this is. We go all the way back to the creation account. A Paul here, he's appealing to common sense. There are obviously differences between men and women. He's referring to scientific evidence. Women have hair and men lose theirs. And he's also referring to the order of creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 insinuating that God has a reason for creating things the way that he does and he is offended when we try to, to change his creation to, to be a way that he didn't design it to be, right? Sexual identity, gender distinctions, the blurring of those natural lines. And while Paul is appealing to order in three different ways, common sense, natural order, and biblical order, the order of creation. The world around him in the first century is appealing to no order at all, except for that of self-indulgence, which creates chaos and disunity. Remember, this whole thing is about unity, yeah? Unity through maturity, understanding, the bringing of understanding. If people today would only read the Bible, go back to the apostles' teaching, we could have unity. People everywhere want unity, and it's here. We have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. You guys will be outside of orthodoxy if this is really the way you want to go. And it's not about head coverings, but it, it is about women posturing themselves like women. It's about men posturing themselves like men. Now, there's a reason that God refers to men as his image and glory. He wants to be perceived in the masculine sense as a father. And Christ came as a male, right? Even the Holy Spirit, despite what's written in that book that was written a long time ago called The Shack, right? That's not a mother and the Holy Spirit isn't effeminate. The Holy Spirit is masculine as well. Like this is how God wants to be perceived. No, the church takes on the feminine characteristics. The object being the object of redemption. That's why the church is the bride of Christ. It's how God wants things to be perceived. This is the message... Paul wants to get to the church at Corinth. Don't go down this road, please. Understand this. This is about God, not you. This is not about your purposes, church. This is not about your idea of social activism, church. Is it surprising that that's what's happening in the first century and that's what's happening now. It's not about your purposes, not about your social activism. This is about the glory of God and how God wants to be perceived and how he has painted a wonderful picture of himself and his church within, within creation. Men have a place of glory and women are exalted. These aren't restrictive because women and men have the liberty to do the same things in the context of the local gathering. 
Maybe not to fill the same offices. Because the office of elder is the office of authority in the church, right? Which is why we reserve the office of elder for men. But that doesn't mean women can't pray and prophesy within the context of church. We shouldn't be contentious about this. Paul says because it's outside of orthodoxy to be contentious about this. And so there's, a, there's an admonition, don't be contentious about this. Because Paul knows it's coming. And he says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. Because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Why does the church at Corinth come together for the worse? They know their doctrine. They know their scripture, but they come together for the worse. Their meeting together accomplishes, accomplishes very little for the purpose of the gospel. You're meeting together for the worse. Why? Because in the way that they're conducting themselves, posturing themselves, they are not representing God. Christ. And Christ is the one in whom we find life, not in our own purposes, not in our social activism, not in our self-identity. In fact, self-identity, identity, by, by another word that's just called sin, right? And so we have our admonition or encouragement this morning. Brothers and sisters, God has designed us to fill a certain place in his kingdom. Live quietly. Serve God humbly. Men, be masculine. Be what God created you to be. Have that manly harshness that God created us to have without sinning. Women, Be feminine. Read Elizabeth Elliot, who speaks to her own culture and screams, let me be a woman. It was Lady Gaga, right, who sang that that song, I was born this way. Here, Paul is actually teaching us to, to be what we were born to be and not to try to change ourselves. That song is actually about changing yourself, isn't it? And then claiming to be born that way after you're trying to change. Here Paul is, be what you were born to be. You don't have to change yourself. God created you the way he meant to. And women, men, we, to try and represent God, to to try and love like Christ, man, talk about having the, the weightiness put on us, but then women getting to be this beautiful, wonderful object of of Christian redemption and a picture of what Christ is doing with the church. In in my opinion, women have the higher place there, the more wonderful place, the more glorious place. And because we get away from, I don't know, silly things like covenant theology, we just totally miss that. But that's what the Bible gives us, and I think it's wonderful. I think it's beautiful. And I think it means a lot for our liturgy. Not necessarily that women have to wear head coverings, but that women should posture themselves like women and men like men. And may we all pray and prophesy to the glory of God. Amen and amen. Audrey, come prophesy for us.